Today on Gritty, I am joined by Adam Yonke, editor-in-chief of the Journal of Mountain Hunting, resident of BC, and the host of the Beyond the Kill podcast. We discuss the issues surrounding the grizzly hunting ban in British Columbia, and we go deep on the topic. But before I launch into the conversation with Adam, I feel it is important to set the stage for the discussion. The topic is not a sexy one, but it's extremely important. So please hang on and slog your way through it because this stuff matters. On August of this year, the left-leaning New Democratic government, propped up by the Green Party, took office in British Columbia in July after ousting the Liberals who had ruled the province for 16 years. A few weeks ago, Doug Donaldson, the province's Minister of Forests and Lands, announced that, quote, It is abundantly clear that the grizzly hunt is not in line with the public's values. Donaldson also said in an interview with the CBC News that the level of grizzly bear hunting in BC is sustainable. However, he said the decision to end trophy hunting is, quote, not a matter of numbers. It's a matter of society has come to the point in BC where they are no longer in favor of the grizzly bear trophy hunt. I can't help but feel deeply disturbed by the government's decision to ban grizzly bear hunting and the justifications behind it. Make no mistake about it, the grizzly bear ban makes the following statement. Hunting is immoral. It's plain and simple. You are an evil, dare I say, unevolved person if you hunt grizzly bears. Hunting grizzly bears is morally reprehensible. We do not need to do this any longer. Please understand that their argument is not based on science or rationale. Their justification for banning grizzly bear hunting is solely based on moral reasoning. These people have argued and lost the health, science, and conservation argument. So they changed tactics and made this a debate about right and wrong, about morality. And the truth is, the hunting debate has and always will boil down to one thing, the morality of it. Is hunting moral? The moral argument against hunting is that hunting kills animals unnecessarily. And this claim depends on the existence of alternative activities that accomplish hunting's effects with less or no animal killing. Some say that nutrition does not justify hunting because we have alternative sources of nutrition, namely agriculture and domestic animal production, which does not kill animals or only kills farm animals. But studies have shown that commercial agriculture production kills more animals than deer hunting per unit of nutrition, hence kills more animals for the same meal. And in terms of animal suffering, it would be difficult to show that death from being maimed, crushed, cut to pieces, poisoned, or starved is less painful than the average death by hunter. Because the reality is that modern farming destroys natural habitat, hence causes starvation or disruption of reproduction. Farming uses pesticides and nitrogenous fertilizer that pollutes groundwater on which animals and humans depend. Farming kills ground-nesting amphibians, reptiles, birds, and small mammals. The reality is that vegetable nutrition is wrung from the earth by diesel-burning machinery and nitrogen and oil-based fertilizers, processed and refrigerated with power from river-altering, coal-burning, or nuclear waste-producing plants, and driven thousands of miles over asphalt by fossil fuel trucks. And it would be difficult to argue that an animal suffers more from hunting than from today's animal husbandry. Thus, if we may eat domestic cattle, we may eat wild deer. To the ideological anti-hunter and the BC government, human-caused animal death and suffering should be reduced as much as possible, if not entirely eliminated. Based on this moral reasoning, In those cases where ethical hunts kill fewer animals for the same nutrition than do farming, ranching, and or vegetarianism, eating hunted meat would be not only morally justified, but morally preferred. It's pretty darn obvious to the rational mind that hunting is moral. So why is hunting so easily marginalized and so easily made to look immoral? Hunting critics propose that it's bad when a hunter shoots a bear. But not bad when a bear mauls and eats a moose calf, because the bear needs to kill to survive. Today, it's pretty tough to explain that human hunting is strictly necessary in the same way that hunting moose is necessary for a bear. Broad public opinion is that hunting is morally permissible only if it is necessary for human survival. Necessary can refer to nutritional or ecological need, which provides moral cover for subsistence hunting and game management. But trophy hunting, by mainstream definition, cannot be defended this way. Trophy hunting is vulnerable to the argument that an act is contemptible not only because of the harm it produces, but because of what it reveals about the character of the trophy hunter. 
The truth is, much of society finds the deriving of pleasure from hunting to be morally repugnant. And this is a problem because hunting is enjoyable, but not in the sadistic evil way that anti-hunters portray. The thing is, actions are powerful and so are words. And the words trophy and sport no longer carry the meaning they once did. The word sport used to mean sporting chance, and it referred to the principle of fair chase as defined by the Boone and Crockett Club, as the ethical, sportsmanlike, and lawful pursuit and taking of any free-ranging, wild, native, North American big game in a manner that does not give the hunter an improper advantage over such animals. Basically, a fairly noble approach to hunting that encourages man to interact with nature on a deeper level. But today, the term sport hunting refers to intentionally killing wild animals for enjoyment. I got that from Wikipedia, folks. Likewise, the term trophy hunting no longer refers to anything noble. It simply means the selective hunting of wild game for human recreation. The trophy is the animal or part of the animal kept and usually displayed to represent the success of the hunt. Folks, these terms have been hijacked and their definitions changed in mainstream media. The terms are consistently used against us to frame hunters as immoral and reprehensible human beings who should be removed from the planet. Meanwhile, hunters and hunting media continue to use these words to our own detriment. As long as we are successfully made to look like people who kill animals for enjoyment and human recreation, we will continue to lose on hunting and conservation issues, even in the face of sound science and rational logic. Truth and perception are everything. I apologize for the long introduction, and I promise it's almost over. But before I close, I want to clarify a few things. After hearing this introduction, some folks might get the idea that I'm anti-farming and anti-ranching. I am absolutely pro-farming and pro-ranching, done responsibly. Frankly, we do not have enough wild animals to sustain a great part of the human population via hunting. Responsible farming and ranching practices should be a key element to an overall food supply plan. So it's not my intention to vilify farming or ranching, only to point out that it's not without its cost to animal life, and that there's a big difference between factory farming done on mass scale and local farming done by responsible, caring human beings. And in the same way, I am not claiming that hunters are some kind of noble lot who only go around doing good deeds. In fact, we have some real contemptible human beings among us. So please don't send me a bunch of emails about how wrong I am about farming or how hunters do bad things too. I recently listened to Jocko Podcast episode 76. It's a good one. I highly recommend that you take the time to listen to it. The guest on this episode is a Vietnam POW survivor, Captain Charlie Plum. And he shares a harrowing tale of six years spent as a prisoner of war at the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam. At one point in the podcast, Charlie says something to the effect of, people think they need to change the way others act, but the reality is you need to change yourself. Think about that as you listen to this podcast. I know I have a lot of work to do when it comes to the person Brian Call. Let the work begin. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm here with Adam Yonke. And uh, Adam, is um, he runs a podcast, Beyond the Kill Podcast. Uh, and you do the Journal of Mountain Hunting, and we'll get into that in a couple of minutes here. Mm -hmm. But today's discussion, I wanted to talk to – we've been trying to hook up for a while to, to talk about some of these – these um, well, basically the, the issues going on, in it are going on in BC around banning grizzly bear hunting. Yeah. And um, so we haven't actually sort of prepped – in any way prior to this call it's a quick quick podcast we're going to hammer out we've both been pretty busy so we've got 30 40 minutes and i wanted to get adam on though quickly while while the issue is still out there in the forefront of people's minds and talk about it and uh adam adam you you live in bc correct i do and how long have you been there uh 11 years 11 years okay so I've seen your posts, um, and and I listened to your podcast you did with Shane Mahoney mm -hmm. back back earlier this year, um, I, around August maybe uh, Wait, September August. The one related to the that was specifically related to the first component of this whole let's call it grizzly hunting debate. Um, if you're referencing that one, yeah, that would have been somewhere around August September. Yep. Yep. 
And I, I listened to that one intensely. Um, Aaron and I kind of uh, half cocked. It just came up because it was a subject that day. And we kind of gave our two cents on it on the Gritty Bowman podcast. And later we were actually in British Columbia and we had a long chat with Bart Lancaster, mm-hmm. you know, kind of a legend in the guide and outfitting area, you know, world out there and, and got his perspective uh, as someone with his feet on the ground, hunting bears, uh, actively being in the wilderness. And, you know, what I wanted to talk to you about was, uh, sort of how did this happen? You know, you, you're kind of more like set the record straight. Like what is going on right now? Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as I can, which is not exactly my strength, but, um, so there, there were two phases to what, to what happened here. So back in the, let's call it early fall, um, a, uh, a decision was made. Legislation was passed that said there would be, uh, no more so-called trophy hunting of grizzly bears in British Columbia. And, and, and the how of that I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but just so people understand the landscape. Um, so that legislation was passed. Um, and, uh, that was put in place in a, in a weird sort of way, meaning uh, the grizzly hunt, which many in this, is, I mean, obviously, but especially the anti-hunting community and um, by association and, and through the efforts of the anti-hunting community, the, the, the wider public were in favor of stopping again, the so-called trophy grizzly hunt. So what the government passed was um, a, a, a form of le- legislation that said that they were going to continue to allow uh, a hunt for grizzly bears as long as hunters took the meat out. So that was that was going to become a requirement, which was not the case. You could in BC legally leave all meat in the field and just take hide, head, and claws if you wanted to. That was legal, deemed legal, deemed not to have any negative impact on the populations. Um, that was what the grizzly hunt entailed. There were, you know, a lot of hunters that would take grizzly meat out of the, out of the bush, the mountains, the inlets, wherever they were hunting them. And then there was, of course, a lot that didn't because they didn't have to. Um, and, uh, and so what was passed was this, this continued allowance of a meat hunt. Um, the particulars behind that, i.e., how that was going to be enforced, um, what was going to where, what was going to be the stipulations within the actual regulations, um, were not clear. So after that decision was made, and and this was just a requirement that you must take the meat yeah, out, but you now, but you must must also leave hide head and claws in the field. You could not keep any portion of that whatsoever, whether you were a Canadian resident or a non-Canadian resident who was coming here on a guided hunt. Now, and I heard Bart, Bart and I, we talked about this extensively, and then you and Shane Mahoney also mentioned it as well, that that's a really tough spot to put for, for the politicians to put themselves in because now they're saying, hey, you know, you can take the meat out, but we are endorsing and actually Wasteful. requiring yeah. you Wasteful. to waste yeah. other parts of the animal yeah. that are useful and valuable. Yeah. So that was an untenable position. I mean, they would it's a lose lose. Like they might, first of all, they're not outright banning bear hunting, which seems to be their overall goal, mm-hmm. right? But they're 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 putting they're basically saying you can't trophy hunt anymore. Right. But then but then at the same time, they're wasting a resource in such a, uh, an ugly way mm-hmm. that, I mean, the whole proposal was half cocked, it seemed from the yeah. get go. Yeah. And then there were certainly people, you know, sort of plugged into the process here in BC that, that thought that was far from the end of the story. And so what happened after that decision came about, yes. So number one, the, you know, the hardcore aunties and the NGOs that were really, um, publicly against, um, any form of grizzly hunting, um, m- Really took the government to cast or to task, excuse me, uh, in that regard. They're saying that, you know, this is a, they're creating a loophole. The trophy hunters will still go and hunt. They'll take pictures and they'll take home the meat. That meat's going to get thrown in a dumpster somewhere, all sorts of stuff like that. That was from the anti hunting community. Yeah. Uh, but what the government did was they, they went into what they, and I'm, I'm the, this may not be the exact term, but essentially a, a consultation process with the public and internally. Uh, and so that, that started after that decision was made. So early this fall, they went into this consultation process basically to determine how they were going to truly implement this whole idea of a meat hunt as opposed to a trophy hunt. Um, so everybody that was involved in that process, 
in particular in the conservation um, and legislative community, um, we're told that it's going to be a meat hunt. We're going to figure out how we're going to, you know, roll this out essentially. Um, and they, as I said, put it into this consultation process so that we have, you know, the auditor general of BC yep. did a report about this, um, you know, science and, you know, or uh, like the researchers, the scientific community, the conservation community were given opportunity to, to, to voice opinion. Uh, and, and there were meetings happening left, right and center. I know the number of people that were involved in those meetings. Um, and then, uh, the ban was to be, uh, effect over this new, sorry, regulation, this, this meat hunt and no trophy hunt was to be effective November 30th of this year. Uh-huh. Well, then on December 18th, just this Monday, um, they announced an outright total province wide ban of all, of all grizzly bear hunting. Um, this took a number of people by surprise. There are people in our community, um, and that, that is the hunting community and especially the BC hunting community that figured it was only a matter of time, but I don't think anybody, at least nobody I've spoken with saw it coming this quickly or this abruptly. Um, and so we are now faced with, um, unless there's some form of legal or political recourse, um, you know, the, this notion of like a vote of no confidence or anything like that. Uh, I don't know if that's on the table right now, but, um, Odds are we're looking at at least three years of no grizzly bear hunting um, being permitted in BC. So that's three years would take us to the next election cycle. Um, and, um, and it came out of nowhere, right? It came out of nowhere. And, and there was a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that's been put, out, been put out by the media and even people that are trying to, you know, discuss this topic that, um, unfortunately, as is, you know, typical for today's, today's day and age, there's, um, you know, it's sound bite you know, current events, right? You take a stat from here or a poll result from there and it gets thrown out and spoon fed to people. And so there's a lot of, um, misinformation, you know, misinformation in a very concerted way, uh, i.e. by design is misleading. Um, but there's also just a lot of people confused exactly how this happened. What are, what are, what are the results? What does the science say? It was all thrown in this big pot, stirred up. And, um, and this is what we ended up with. So this decision, though, um, this was not a vote by the BC residents. It was not. No, that that's probably one of the most um, misunderstood components of this for people that live outside of BC. And, and, and there's a there's a stat that's thrown around quite a bit. There has been this week, um, which is that 78 percent of the BC public were in favor of an outright ban. <clears throat> now, if you look at what was actually cited in the news media around that is in that consultation process I mentioned where, you know, post meat hunt only being implemented and this, you know, what's going to, how are they going to actually, you know, what are the mechanics of rolling this new regulation out? They were in this, this consultation process. And so they, the, the BC government, um, like the fish and wildlife branch, um, put out basically a, a call for, um, for input from the public. So this was a, a, a website a form you could go fill out, um, or you could submit a, an email to this specific email address. Right. So, so when that was done, they received 4,180 emails in response to this, this call for consultation from the public. Yep. And the stat that has been thrown out is that 78% of those responses, so just over 4,000, were in favor of an outright ban. So it's not 78% of the population. It's, you know, roughly 3,300 people that said they were in favor of the ban. Um, now the other thing that gets thrown around a lot is that this was a biased sample pool. It, it was not. This was not an attempt to take a small segment of the population and see what they said. This was available to anybody. I mean, the entire hunting community could have responded if they wanted to, right? And we could have had 50,000 emails being against the ban, right? The hunting community didn't respond and that that's on our shoulders to, to carry that, that weight. Um, but this is not a true, I don't feel, and most people I know don't feel that this is a true representation of what the BC public wants. The second part of this, that's a little bit confusing. I was having a conversation about this this morning is that that call for consultation, this, 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 um, this opportunity for people to email in and provide their input, um, at no point in that process is a outright ban listed as one of the things they're asking for, um, input on. 
And so what we're trying to figure out in the hunting community, and we may be able to do this through the Freedom of Information Act, is get our hands on those emails and see what was actually said. Um, because they had, they had sort of three or four broad questions um, that all surrounded the distinction between trophy hunting and meat hunting, nothing about an outright ban. Um, so we actually don't know what was in those emails, and we don't know what people said. If they said, yeah, go for the meat hunt, we don't want the, the trophy hunt, then okay, that's one thing. And, you know, I think for the most part, the BC community would be okay, BC hunting community would be okay with that. Um, as long as science and conservation was, was sort of kept in the fray. Um, but we actually don't know what was in those emails. It's entirely possible, I will acknowledge, that those 78% of people said, you know, screw this meat hunt stuff, just ban it outright. That is possible. I'm not saying that's not possible, but we actually don't know what was in those emails. Um, and uh, most of the people I've spoken with that, you know, aren't just flying off the handle about this, that have been plugged into this whole process of trying to work with the government to arrive at a reasonable, you know, solution that is, you know, at least in part focused on a conservation based solution, um, feel that, um, the government was going to make this happen anyways. And the meat hunt was a, was a red herring that it was going to impose a ban anyways. And why do you say that? Because the, I mean, like you said, you know, why, why go through this meat hunt trophy hunt process put it out to, you know, a, a con put it through a consultation process with the public um, and then effectively disregard all of that and just implement an outright ban. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't really make a ton of sense um, to have gone down that path other than to not make a, or, or not um, create a major pushback from the hunting and I was going to say hunting and fishing, but let's be honest, predominantly hunting community when they were recently elected. Because when this whole meat and trophy hunt um, decision was made, they were very new to be to being in power. Now, that brings up a really important point. Um, this government, there's, they're, they're known as the New New Democrat Party. So they're, you know, left very left of Democrat, if we want to put this in a U.S. context. Um, okay. Did not actually win their the election. They actually lost by one seat. Um but they formed a coalition with another party called the Green Party, which is even further left of Democrat, um, that allowed them through this coalition to essentially take the, the seat of government, um, which is, uh, you know, legal and that's just politics and, you know, get over it. Um, but that's how this government was put in place that so that these sort of things could be pushed uh, through. So what does this government stand for? Like what are, what is their stance on hunting in general? Oh, that's a really good question, Brian. I mean, um, based on <laughs> recent events, um, I would say fairly against hunting. Um, I don't know that you'd ever find anything to support that other than the opinions of those in the hunting community that know what it's like to deal with them and in, in the back rooms that, you know, where these decisions are made. Um, but, um, they are very, ha Go ahead. Adam, haven't they said, haven't, I mean, I've read articles where they've mm -hmm. said, um, elements of the party have said they, you know, this is one step. Eventually they want to ban, uh, grizzly bear hunting altogether. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they'd like to go after black bear. And then mm -hmm. eventually they'd like to go after, right? Like, yeah. haven't I heard? Oh, for sure. For sure. But, but this is the confusing part, right? And this is where we got it. We have to be a little bit careful. So the, um, the predominantly urban constituency and then the, you know, the members of the party that would, would, you know, sit in those ridings as we would call them here in Canada, um, will most likely fall into that camp, right? Um, yep. the rural, um, members of these, of, of the same party probably don't, right? Or at least will, will act as voices of reason, um, when it comes to that sort of a discussion. And there are, there are rural, rural ridings that have, um, you know, members of parliament, um, from um, the the new new Democrat Party or the NDP, so right. I, I think it's I think it's a little bit unfair to th and I I'm, look I'm not trying to create like an urban rural divide here, but I think it's unfair to to paint the whole party that way because I, I you know that get but it takes us down the road that you and I know we can no longer go down right pointing fingers and and creating and building walls right and so right. I, I I know there are people within that party who. Um, will not be in favor of this. In fact, many years ago, I believe it's two decades ago, when they initially put this on, on the table, um, 
they had people outright leave the party because of it, typically from rural ridings, but there yeah. were people within the party that were definitely against it. And so what we're trying to get our heads wrapped around is how much of this is representative of the the NDP, i.e. the whole whole party, um, as opposed to certain and very powerful because of their population bases, um, ridings that um, tend to lean um, against hunting. Yeah, I mean, when they first came out with this, one of the, the statements that really got me all hot and bothered and fired up, one of the officials came forward and said, this is the decision. It's not based on science. It's mm-hmm. not based on sustainability. Mm-hmm. That We have plenty of grizzly bears, and we know that it's sustainable population. This is based on morality. And the BC people are no longer mm-hmm. morally able to, to, to live with the hunting of grizzly bears because yeah. it's, it's morally wrong. Yeah. So that was the, I mean, when someone comes forward with that, they're, they're, they basically dismiss science, mm-hmm. like all oh, together, yeah. science, yeah. Yeah. game absolutely. management, anything yeah. else, right? Yeah. And now they've called this a moral action. Yeah. And I understand not pointing fingers, like, but I also want to call things out for what they are, <laughs> like the truth of a situation. Oh, absolutely. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and from my perspective, they're taking a – they're calling themselves moral when they're immoral. And, and the reason I say that is because in my mind, to, to ban the hunting of, a, of an animal like the grizzly bear or, or, or so on, to me, is it's an ideological mm-hmm. approach mm-hmm. to the world we live in, mm-hmm. not one that's based on sound science the health of all species across the board. When I was in BC, you know, hearing Bart talk about the the decline in moose populations yeah. and that grizzly bears are thriving mm-hmm. and getting quotas and permits to hunt them is not that easy no. and it's fairly restricted and it's not updated frequently enough. And the idea that, you know, bears are where the, the government likes to say they're at or, or yeah. Is, yeah. is it's not accurate. No. And this is with feet and hands on the ground. And then you see the 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 ungulate populations dropping, especially moose, and it's, it's disturbing. It's alarming to to sit down and to say science doesn't matter, wildlife management doesn't matter. What matters is morality, and we're morally superior to the point where where this isn't right anymore. Yeah, um, is hypocritical on so many levels. Mm-hmm. First of all, most of those people are meat eaters. Yeah. Like some ninety five percent of the planet are yeah. meat eaters. Yeah. You know, I've been following a lot of Canadian politics in the last year and a half, and the things going on in in Ontario and Toronto around compelled speech laws and Jordan B. Peterson and this leftist movement that's yeah. very strong and very pervasive in college campuses. It's freaking me out, dude. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. like, I really feel like there's uh, some ideological beliefs that have become more important than actual facts and reality. Yeah. And that, that these people that have those beliefs, they've gone to a point where they, they want those beliefs enforced at all costs, mm-hmm. regardless of, you know, of, uh, what's actually best. Yeah. So there are people I feel like, yes, we can absolutely reach across the aisle, mm-hmm. relate to get at common goals. But when you're dealing with the ideological and the extremist groups, I don't think that there's going to be any progress made in converting them or or coming to some middle ground. Yeah, that's just a that's just a battle. Yeah, that's just something where it's like, okay, well, how are we voting, and yeah. what are the people we're voting for, mm-hmm. and are they reasonable? Can, you know, this to me is like a. A unilateral decision. This isn't some vote. It's, that it's, it's, it's authoritarian. I mean, it's, it, it reeks. Uh, I, I put a post up on Instagram calling it sociocultural fascism, right? And I, and I took some heat for that, but it's not far off. It you, is. No, you, you're, it, that's exactly the definition. Yeah. Um, I, I heard a, a quote the other, or, or something I read the other day that said the best comparison for pathological ideologies is that thoughts are like mental software, and software code can be written whose only goal it is to spread is to spread regardless of the damage it does to yeah. the individual yeah. computer that's running it. Yeah. Ideologies are like mental viruses that propagate from mind to mind. Yeah. And when you just say it's wrong to kill bears, period. Yeah. 
and and that's it. And that's your ideology. And then you're trying to enforce that at all costs. It's a really unhealthy and dangerous place to be. Yeah, and it's that that at all costs part of this is is really the crux of the issue, right? Is you know you, all governments and all governments in power, um, for the most part, play to the whims of the people, right? Right. Um, and and so a, a critical component of this, and, I, and I've ranted about this a ton on on our podcast, and and that's part of why I say you know, we need to reach across the aisle because, um, you know, it was one of the things Shane kind of took me to task on, but also, um, you know, it, it's, there's a, a fatalistic what's done is done feeling I have nowadays yeah. a little bit. Right. But I completely agree, Brian, is we do, you know, you're at the post you put up on Instagram recently about hearts and minds and, and changing the, you know, the heart of people is, is, was a phenomenal post. And so thank you for putting that out there. Um, but one of the the comments I think hit hit on some important things, which is um, we are we're dealing with a an ideology um, and a a very sophisticated system to to spread as you said that you know like a virus um, that ideology that we as the you know hunting and conservation community were not ready for or um, had. Yeah, I don't even know if we really saw it coming for what it was or the, the, the speed and the power at which it could be implemented, right? Yeah, the crux of the, the first podcast Aaron and I had about this whole subject mm-hmm. was, yeah, this sucks and, and everything about it smells wrong. It's actually not about the bears, the, 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 the idea that this will help bear populations and nature on the whole. It's actually – it's not. It's not going to do that. And, and just quickly, Brent, like that's not just you and I saying that, or a bunch of hunters saying that. Like that's every expert, every scientist, the BC Auditor right. General that said hey. this is this is there is zero negative impact to bear populations by the maintenance of a hunt. And so that people understand that listen to this and say in the U.S., what we're talking about in terms of hunt killed bears per year is less than three hundred bears. Like this is a highly, highly, highly restricted hunt, and it has been right. that way for a very long time. Right. And, and the economics behind it are massive. Mm-hmm. I mean, really fuels the Canadian economy. And it's a natural recurring resource mm-hmm. that will continue to feed mm-hmm. and, and, and supply the, the, the economy. And those bears have to be managed anyway. Like we've gone down this road and discussed mm-hmm. it yeah, yeah. a lot. Most hunters realize this. The crux of the whole podcast, the whole, the whole point of the show that Aaron and I did was, though, to say, look, we did this to ourselves, though. Like, mm-hmm. there's some extreme ownership here. Yeah, like, absolutely. Hunters failed. Yeah. We failed somehow. And how do we get to these places where the mainstream public decides that to side with the anti-hunter, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. How do we get to that place? How come they're not siding with the hunter, right? And mm-hmm. what can we do about it? And these are questions that I'm – that I'm asking myself, that I'm I'm sharing, and one of the response I got was, "Sorry, people, but we will never win by changing the hearts of the voters. A dead animal is a dead animal. People prefer live animals, plain and simple, over logic, over science, over common sense. A live animal over over a dead animal wins every time. Sadly, a majority make decisions on emotion, not logic. The discussion needs to be placed on science-based studies, not voter feelings." My question is, what do you think about that? So, um, I, I um, you're probably not going to find somebody that believes as much in the North American wildlife conservation model as, as myself. Well, I mean, you'll find lots of people, but within the hunting community, I'm, I'm as bought into that concept as anybody. And I don't mean the lip service of, look what we did. Look at, you know, the national parks, the elk, the deer. But yes, we've done all that stuff. Get over it, right? We've, we've done all that stuff. I mean it from everything from the, tro- the, the benefits that, um, that trophy hunting bring to the table. Like it or lo- like it or not, from a you know a, a let's let's use the term moral perspective, um, there are clear and obvious benefits to trophy hunting. And there are clear obvious benefits to all forms of hunting. Um, however, we have forever in the hunting community talked about science and conservation, and where is it where has it gotten us? 
We're, we're sitting here with, with, with a band in a province that is, you know, one of the, the best destinations to hunt North American big game. Um, that economics was, don't lie. Econo- economics don't lie. The science don't, that d- doesn't lie. Um, and we didn't, we didn't play the, the, the game on the field. Right. Um, and that, I mean, we could go way back and talk. I mean, everybody likes to throw TV under the bus and TV shows and, you know, 26 bucks and 26 minutes, right. Stuff like that. Sure. Like we can talk about that sort of stuff and then that's contextual. Sure. Um, things are changing. We all know things are changing and what's going on, what's going on on Instagram. There's a lot more of, let's just call it the more palatable hunting material. Um, than there used to be, right? Still lots of kill shots and gripping grins and that sort of stuff. And, and that's fine. That's part of our culture that, that others just don't understand. And maybe we need to change that wholesale. I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer is to that. Um, but the reality is that as you pointed out, Brian, there is a component to this whole debate, um, a component uh, of the population that is so ideological that we will never change, you know, their hearts and minds. And, and, and nor do I think we should even try to. I think our only option there is when we get punched in the mon- mouth, we punch them in the nose, right? I, yep. I think I, I truly believe that. And I know there's people that get sick of hearing me in our audience. Look, look I'm, I agree wholeheartedly because the, the deal is, and I know people don't like to, to talk about this, but, you know, I feel like, I like Jocko Willink. I'm a big fan of Jocko. I love his podcast. One of the things I love about Jocko is that he's not afraid to talk about good versus evil. Like he's like, yeah, sorry people. That's a language we understand. This is the real world. This is the real world. It's part of being that, that psychologically we, we feel or we know something is good and evil. And when people are ideological to that point, even to the point with other areas like compelled speech laws, you know, restricting freedom of speech, you know, you're borderline, you know, you're moving into fascist categories, dictatorships and neo-Marxist postmodernism type stuff, Mm -hmm. which the model has been tried. Millions of people have been murdered in under these types of governments. And yet there seems to be this. So there's a, there's absolutely an ideological component both in 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 America and in Canada mm-hmm. of of individuals who to me um you know it's it's part of socialism which I feel is completely morally wrong it it doesn't matter like if if you take money from it's stealing mm-hmm. like you take money from someone else and give it to someone else it's stealing whether you voted for it or not mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. like I feel like there is a good and evil discussion out there when it comes to ideology, and ideology doesn't have a place in our government, in our political system. It needs to be wiped out. Mm-hmm. And when someone comes at, a, at, at hunting from the perspective of it's absolutely morally wrong and ignores science, economics, and, and the natural world. Mm-hmm. The, the, I, the, nat- the natural laws of the of world. The, the world. <laughs> I, I, I start to – I, I'm like, okay, that's just wrongness. Mm-hmm. It's evil at the core. Yeah, and and I agree. They're if they're coming out, you can't just be like, oh, well, they're nice guys. We can reach out. We can shake. That we can get along. We can figure out a way. It's not going to work. No, and, and and if I could throw out a few examples, just and, and so the whole point of this this part of the discussion, Brian, I think is we do need to understand what happened and how and some of the mechanics, yeah. and I mean like the tactical mechanics, the the, the strategies they use, and I mean like they use well-proven, as you and I know, well-proven, you know, f- sort of sales funnel processes to disseminate this information to a large proportion of the audience that didn't know any better. So when we yes. talk about I- ideology, right, you know, people talk about, you know, the, the, you know, the various wars in the Middle East and the various theaters in the, in the Middle East, right? And they always say, well, you know, we being the allies, we left a vacuum. So of course ISIS filled it, or of course Al Qaeda filled it, right? Mm-hmm. So when a vacuum is left, right, and people are in, in for whatever reason, and we could, you know, I don't think we need to go into the socioeconomics of why there are these leftist movements happening in, um, in, in, in other countries. But if there are people who feel wronged in some way or lost in some way that don't have 
to, to their minds, uh, a purpose, right? Or a way to fulfill a purpose, even if they do have a purpose, um, they are going to become disenchanted and they're going to look for things to attack. And that vacuum was filled in part by the, a lot of these anti-hunting NGOs that, that steered, excuse me, I will, um, correct myself, manipulated public opinion um, through a very, very dedicated and sophisticated propaganda campaign. And and so to your point about ideology and people saying, oh yeah, maybe we can get along with the antis or figure them out, go to the website of the Rain Coast Conservation Foundation, go to the website of Pacific Wild, go to the website of Sea Legacy, and I could keep going, and see the things they say. Or read on the Journal of Mountain Hunting website, just search the word jihad, because um, I wrote an article years ago called a jihad by any other name. And I was inflammatory language, and I've had a lot of people call me out on that one. But I was obviously very fired up at the at the time of the writing. That was uh, you know, one of those articles that just basically appeared on paper, well, mm-hmm. um, on the screen. Um, and I list out some of the things they say said um, about the grizzly hunt that were patently false. Truly and utterly patently false, but they spoon fed it to a public that didn't know any better. And of course, when you ask a person, are you okay with, you know, hunters using, what did they say, paramil- paramilitary style assaults to, uh, hunt coastal bears and lopping their heads off and leaving the carcass in the woods? Well, you know, if, if I wasn't a hunter, I'd probably say, well, yeah, I'm against that. Right. It, it sounds horrible. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so on the ideological side of things, I, I think we, we do need to do essentially a, a post-mortem on what happened, right? So we can see just when you say that these people are immoral and unethical, even though they, they supposedly stand for morals and ethics in some fashion. Um, so we can see what we were and, and will continue to be for the foreseeable future up against, right? Um, and it's, and, and on top of that, since this, this ban was imposed, one of the, um, the heads of one of these organizations or those organizations I listed, came out and ranted on, I don't know where it was, Instagram or Twitter, but saying that this was, you know, I mean, the, the paraphrase is, we are better humans for this decision. The killing of bears in any fashion for hide, you know, head or meat is, and he literally says, bull, and I don't know if you'll bleep that out or whatever, but um, is, is, is BS, right? And said, you know, we are, this is a, a moral high ground we needed to, reclaim effectively is it their thoughts that cougar um th- the 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 um sorry the hunter in alberta that, that killed that cougar recently um he's i mean he's taking heat and i mean like like genitalia references to the size of his genitalia that is yep, from the yep. from, from the former prime minister's wife who hunts who, who grew up in a hunting and fishing family and he went so far as to not just post the, you know, the, the, not the grip and grin, but the hug and grin of, of the cat with, you know, cougar stir fry. So he even went so far as to, to show the process from, yes, I killed this animal, but you know what? I turned it into food. And so coming back to this ideology, I think what we have to understand, and this is something I've felt very strongly about for a long time, is people keep saying, oh, it's about the food. It's about the food. It's about the food. If we just tell them about the food, they're going to be okay with it. And for a big part of the population, I hope that's true. But there is a segment of, of this population that we are truly in a battle with that that does not matter. They don't care about the food because, like you said, it's an ideological view of the world that all killing of all animals is bad. I, I, I think, you know, you, there's, it's, it's a, I mean, we're, we all know we're not going to convince the, the obsessively anti-hunter ideological hypocrite out there of we're not going to convince them to change, mm-hmm. right? They're pathological. Mm-hmm. They're extreme to an point to Le- a point. Le- where, legitimately, yeah. But there's a whole subset of the population that is that is influenced or manipulated by their messaging. Absolutely. And, and by the things that they 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 do. Mm-hmm. And and uh, it's disgusting. And so I think there's a couple of things where yeah, we as hunters, we have to actually go to work. There's something out there that we have to do. When I hear a comment like, sorry, people, but we will never win by changing the hearts of the voters. Uh, every fiber of my being, every mm-hmm. part of my soul rebels against a statement like that. Yeah. Because it basically says, it dismisses us from all responsibility and says, it doesn't matter what we do. 
Yeah. No matter how hard we work or what we try to do, we can make no difference. Yeah. So let's just quit. Like I, I, I can't stand it. I can't stand it because we absolutely have power. We absolutely can make change. Yeah. We absolutely can can make a difference. And it's not just like when I say change the hearts of the people, I'm not talking about changing the high, the hearts of the ideologues. No. It's not going to happen. I want to change the hearts of the people that – are influenced hunters, by them. Non-hunters, yeah. yeah. And and part of that means undressing the, the pretty package that these ideologues have, have wrapped themselves up in. Mm -hmm. Let's call it for what it is. Mm -hmm. And when they bring up a debate on morals, because that's what they've done. They've taken it out of the scientific arena. Yeah. They've taken it out of the natural world. They've taken it out of this other – and they've made it a moral argument. And then we as hunters, we continue to argue about science and diet and meat. Yeah. And it's like we don't need to go there even. We can still – we need to argue with them on the, on the soccer field they're, they're playing soccer on. And that's, that's the whole thing where we can have a, a, a moral discussion, an ethics discussion on killing mm -hmm. and, and, and how we live. And I think it should be happening at a moral level more. Than it does now. Absolutely. Does that mean we dismiss all the facts and all the science? No, of course not. Or conservation statistics like that stuff's powerful. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there's there's not enough of a, a discussion um, when when they make it about morals. Let's also make it about morals. Yeah. We have all of it on our side. Yeah. Well, as an example, um, I was doing a bit of digging about some of the people involved with some of the the worst of the NGOs that you know, we're in large part responsible for this. And, um, and one of the individuals that's a major contributor owns a real estate development company. This is in the Vancouver area. Mm -hmm. That real estate development company has a number of projects in the works that is, um, in prime black bear habitat. Right. Yeah. So they're, they're cutting swaths in the mountains and, you know, the subalpine to put in, you know, condo and townhouse developments. Um, and absolutely positively taking away critical black bear and I should say also black tail habitat. Yeah. Um, so like, and, and I bring that up as an example to say like, look, you know, we've been, we've been fighting with rubber bullets or maybe even bows and arrows. And I know this is a gritty bowman. Um, but they've been coming at us with, with howitzers. Right. Um, yeah. and, and, and so I, I mean, where we go from here is so multi-pronged, right? There, there's, there's an external, you know, we, when we get punched in the mouth, we kick them in the junk, right? There's that part of it. And that's the antis. There's the internal work that needs to be done. Like you were just highlighting, right? The work we have to do. And I was talking about this on our, <clears throat> our most recent podcast covering this topic. Um, you know, this notion of hunting is conservation, right? Uh -huh. It's true. We all know it's true, but that has empty meaning. Right. We all just lob that out there. Right. Hunting is conservation. And we're like, ah, I did my, I did my duty today. Correct. Right. Like, I can hashtag that. Right. Right. <laughs> um, and look, like I, 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 I've done that countless times, you know, on our, on our online magazine side or through our Instagram channel or whatever. But we've got to grow up and get past that. Right. Like you said, this is, yes, we have, there is no debating us on the science side. There is none. Mm -hmm. We've, you know, hundreds of years, no, not hundreds, a, a hundred years of data effectively to back us up. But that now I will, I will say this, that Shane Mahoney says this often. He's mm -hmm. like our own country, our own population doesn't know our history, sure, our conservation history. They don't know the story. So, I mean, I think that, we have all the stats and the facts, and, and I'm not, I don't think either one of us are saying not to tell our story because no, I no, think no, stories no, are no. powerful, and I think the conservation ethic in America, how it got here and what it's done, that's as, as much as it's well-known to a lot of us, not well-known to the broader community, mm -hmm. but I, I, I think I'm in agreement with where you're going with this in the sense that you know that's not the only message that we should be bringing forward, and it's not – the silver bullet that we think it is. Well, it's not. So what I was driving at there is, of course, I agree with what you said. 
Brian, like I, mean, like I said at the outset, it's, I couldn't believe more. I mean, if I had tattoos, I'd probably have that tattooed on my body somewhere. Yeah. But, but the point being that it, it, it's not the silver bullet and it can't be our leading comment anymore. It can't be the first thing we say to people because exactly like you point out, people don't understand. They don't know. We have to get them, you know, and not even on side with us, but we have to have an engaged conversation so they understand why. And I don't mean why on the statistical basis. Like what does the hunt or going hunting mean to us, right? And how many people do we know that, you know, get into hunting for the first time and it is, you know, life altering for them that the, right. the immersion in that experience is something that is really hard to put into words. And I know I wax philosophical all the time and yada, yada, yada. But point being that we, as, as you put out or pointed out in that post, we haven't been focused on the, the playing field that matters. So not only were we not even playing soccer, we didn't even, we weren't even playing, we, we, we weren't even playing the other sport in the same city. Right. We were talking about different stuff that makes sense to us and will make sense to some people. But that huge subset of the population that just doesn't understand um, and is open minded, um, right. you know, we need to lead with something else. Right. And I'm not saying I have the answer to that. I'm just saying we can't just keep falling back on the silver bullet that we have. Yeah. I just heard, um, I just posted a post this morning with Cameron Haynes and Joe Rogan on their UA hunt film that they did together. Mm -hmm. The thing had got, it's it had so much play in mainstream media outlets and positive, mm -hmm. like so much positivity surrounding it. So much, so very little negativity and anti hunters aren't attacking yeah. that film. Mm -hmm. You got to ask yourself, they are always attacking stuff. Well, what do they attack? Well, they, they're not attacking the UA hunt film. They're not attacking Cam Cameron Haynes and Joe Rogan out there hunting elk together. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're not going anywhere near it. They won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. But what do they go after? Well, they go after a Josh Bomar spear video mm -hmm. killing a bear. Mm -hmm. So that to me is one illustration of it's absolutely critical how we as hunters yeah. share our message. Mm -hmm. Because when we share a message that's unassailable, where you know to hunt, to attack it from an anti-hunter perspective just makes them look dumb mm -hmm. to the public. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of content we should be creating. Mm -hmm. When you talk about should we be getting rid of grip and grim, you know, or should we should we even have that, or or the moniker trophy, mm -hmm. or should we be using trophy hunting as a phrase anymore? Mm -hmm. Honestly, I I I I I struggle with all of that yeah. because it's so natural for me to 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 use the terms and to, and to say, I don't need to apologize, never apologize for being a hunter and blah, blah, blah. But the reality is this, that my message no longer is for only the hunting community. No, it's, it used to be years ago that if you wanted to find hunting content, you had to actively go to a channel, mm -hmm. find it, watch it. You had to actually buy a, a paper publication mm -hmm. and open it up and read it. So your, your, your message just didn't, overflow into other communities and the broader public, which was bad to me overall. And, and cause it helped, we were able to, to cultivate our own little culture. It's an echo chamber. Yeah. That accepted behaviors that the, 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 the broader public isn't able to accept. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it's like whenever a hunter goes out now and pr produces a form of content, or shares their hunt, or shares their story. It now needs to be built and shared in a way that resonates with humanity mm -hmm. at large, mm -hmm. not just and, not and just and ho your little. Uh, sorry, Brian, but and and not just our version of humanity, right? Because we can we can sit here in our community and say we've hunted forever, we've hunted for you know since the dawn of time or millennia or whatever you know time stamp you want to put on it. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's true. Again, that's true. Right? right. But there's not a lot of people that, that, that can understand that still. Right. So when you say humanity, yeah. like, like I think we just, we got to like the, the, to me, the crux here is we, as you just pointed out with, you know, our echo chamber and this insulated community we lived in, and we haven't looked outward with open eyes. Right. We haven't looked out outside our community and said, okay, what are they thinking and what are they saying? And, 
how do I engage with that person? Right. That's the, the typical thing is, well, I don't need to apologize for being a hunter and I post my pictures for my buddies. Right. right? O- okay. But look, dudes and dudettes, like that's really damn selfish nowadays. It is. You can't ignore the world we live in. It's, it's, I didn't make the reality. No, it's just there. It's just there. You no. Know? Right. And, and it's, it's, it's not like I am, I'm saying, um, uh, you know, that, that you can't be real or anything like that. I'm just, I'm saying that there's, there is a responsibility you have to the world at large to bring them along. Like Joe Rogan, I, I remember him talking, he's like, you can't just take some suburban white mom and, and, uh, you know, throw in her face a bloody carcass <laughs> or, or, or blow off, you know, a wolf's head in front of her and have her go, Oh, you know, that's cool. Like it they doesn't need to be managed. Okay. Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> it's completely, she's not ready for that. She can't, yeah. she can't go there. And terms like trophy hunter, you know, I've been list- thinking about this for a while. You know, you hear uh, identity politics thrown around a lot and you hear the word white privilege and basically, you know, basically cause well, you're white, nothing you say has any validity cause you're white. Right. right? right. And I think that the term Trophy hunter works very, very well in the hands of the anti-hunter. Yeah. So they can sit there and say, well, so-and-so is a trophy hunter. Yeah. And now nothing you say matters. They can boil it down, yeah, that's so true. reduce it to that basic level, yeah. and then dismiss anything you have to say. Your opinion is no longer valid. Yeah. And so I think that, that those are real things we have to, cons- we have to decide, you know, do we, do we want to, you know, do we need that stuff? Do we need need yeah. to hold on to those statements and, and that, that, those kinds of words and phrases that are basically been hijacked yeah. by, no, we, by we've, that. We've community. lost them. We've lost them. And that, that's a tough one for me, Brian, because like I, I was a, I would consider myself to be a converted trophy hunter and I'm not a very good one because I don't have a lot of things on the wall. But in, in that, you know, I, when I, um, when I really, when, when the, the fire for hunting took a whole new level for me. I was living in Vancouver. Uh-huh. Um, I'd come off of a number of years in school and postgraduate stuff and, and hadn't hunted a ton simply because of time and, and in, in certain ways, opportunity. Um, and uh, so I was, you know, in this large urban, fairly left leaning, you know, uh, from a political perspective city in this, you know, epic environment being, you know, the coast and the mountains. Um, and as I got back into hunting in a huge way, um, I found myself defaulting to the whole meat hunter label. Right? Well, I do it for the meat, do it for the whatever. Um, and then as I got more and more involved in this in this business or this industry, I started to do a bit of digging right on the whole concept of, of trophy hunting and, and the, the trophy records database that was established by the Boone and, Cro- uh, Boone and Crockett Club, why that was put in place, how that data and, and those statistics are utilized. Um and, and then you look at what, you know, essentially by definition is, is the selective, um, harvest or hunting by, you know, some or most trophy hunters. And I considered myself to be, to be wrong prior to that. Right. So I, I was, I was essentially, I would say I wasn't against trophy hunting, but I would say I'm not, I'm not one of those or I'm not a trophy hunter and blah, 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 blah. And then I, I quickly sort of, I would say became one, um, in that I was very selective in, in the things or have been very selective in the things that I'm willing to, to, to kill. Um, and, um, and so where I'm going with that is for a very long time, I felt we needed to defend that label, that we needed to retake that label. And that couldn't be further from the truth. It's gone. It's lost. Like you said, it has been so, clearly distilled to an automatically negative label that we can never ever kind of get back on into the discussion yeah. around right um that we we need to discard some of these things and that that pains me to say but you know it's, it's the you know got to break an egg to make us you know an omelet here right yeah. and, and that's and then that's the real that's the reality right that's the point is that's the reality that yeah. we're in, we're in right I know you, you got to go here pretty soon, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to go way philosophical on you here. <laughs> I'm, I'm good go. for at least, I'm, I'm good for 10 minutes. Yeah. I'm going to go a little deep here. Um, I, I truly feel that, um, you know, I don't do this very often, but you know, you look at anti hunters and their messaging 
and uh, believe me, I, I'm in the spotlight, and so I post things, and I get I get large quantities of hate. Okay, and and it's 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 sometimes orchestrated and targeted and planned with groups of vegans and anti hunters that come down on Gritty Bowman, right? And um, and I and I hear words and and it again it, we're talking about pathological people that are ideological like to the core, and these ideas rule all their thoughts. Like there's nothing that they can, they cannot, uh, actually look objectively at anything. And they, they will say humanity is a, human beings are a parasite on the earth and that humans are disgusting and that the earth would be a better place without humans on it. Mm. And when I hear that language, I think it's, it's so wrong. At, at a moral level, do they not hear themselves talking? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's because of my, my, you know, my core beliefs, but I, I sit there and I think that's not much different than, I mean, I've read about the rise and fall of the third Reich, mm -hmm. Nazi Germany. I've read Viktor Frankl's man search for meaning. I've read the, the Gulag archipelago. I've studied Maoist China, the Khmer Rouge and the killing fields. And I look at that stuff and I think to myself, it wasn't that far of a stretch to, to, to say under, for example, Hitler, we need to just kill this whole population of people. What we need to do is build this utopian world. Like we get to decide which yeah. humans live and should yeah. stay here, yeah. but we need to just murder the rest. Mm -hmm. And that's that statement. Mm -hmm. That is that statement to it, the fundamentally to the core. Human beings are a parasite on the planet. That is that is hateful at so many levels, and to me, it's this this battle of ideas that's going on, mm -hmm. and and this hunting discussion is just a subset of it. Yeah. That there is something deeper here where people are saying humanity is wrong, evil, and and in, and basically, if it were up to them, we just get rid of them. A huge part of it, and I think it's it's evil. Yeah. It's evil embodied, and I look at it, and I think the opposite. I think that. Human beings have a um, – what if we all embraced like a whole different – what if we were actually tried to live intrinsically good lives? Mm -hmm. What impact would that have? Yes, human beings aren't perfect and we screw up all the time. But, but Adam, what about people being better? Yeah. And if we all lived better, would we not and, – and we're less selfish and more giving and, 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 and more, I guess – morally better humans what impact would that have on the planet oh it'd be massive it'd be it'd be it'd be, it'd be, in, be beyond massive and, and you know the, the thing that i think you know, when you talk about those those very significant events and periods in history where you know somebody looking from outside planet earth whoever that might be would say what the hell is going on down there like <laughs> so i think one of the scary scary parts of, of that that side of this is like, that doesn't happen overnight. Right? You know, people didn't just snap their fingers and all of a sudden they're like, we hate X subset of the population or X, yeah. you know, supposedly supposed race. Um, it's, it's a slow boil. Right. Mm -hmm. And then like a boiling pot, it's like, yeah, is this damn thing going to start to bubble? And then boom, it hits its boiling point. Right. And, um, and I think there's a lot going on in, the real world right now where people aren't living, you know, intrinsically good or fulfilled lives, good, good, bad. Like yeah. I, I like the term fulfilled. Um, and they're looking for some form of an outlet either for their anger um, or like, like frankly, you know, this, this sort of sense of the need to contribute, like some form of altruism, right? Like I do think there's a large portion of you know, the non-hunting public that actually think they're doing the right thing when they, you know, potentially vote or, or, or sign off on a poll saying, yeah, I'm against trophy grizzly bear hunting. Those things are beautiful and blah, blah, blah. And I agree, right? They are beautiful. Um, but there's a place for hunting. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's more of a, it's more of a state of the union of, of what's going on in the wider world when a person feels that they've made a contribution by, you know, hitting a button on their phone to say yes to a poll, right? Or, you know, 
firing a comment up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram when um, they could get involved in a more meaning, meaningful way, you know, hands on, right? Dude, I, I, I agree. I, I think that when you look at each of these times in history that were dark and were, were, were really evil things happened, mm-hmm. I feel like it was a point where the individuals – we're no longer individuals. Like they became a state, mm-hmm. part of a machine. They became part of a group. And one thing that's great about, I think, Western civilization is accountability of the individual. Like you are in charge of you. You you can be choose to be good, or you can choose not to be. And when you choose to to be, from an individual perspective, someone that makes a difference, and you work at that then societies have a chance. I heard Jocko talk about this on a podcast where he was explaining, talking about it like when the individual fails, when thousands and thousands of individuals fail, that's when things like the gulag take place. Right. And so I think it's just a a situation where, you know, I don't like to hear talk that doesn't take extreme ownership where you're not saying, you know, where you – you know, you're dismissing, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. I can't change anything. Yes. And the yes. world is this kind of place and yeah. all humans should just be, you know, wiped out. You know, the planet would be better off without us. And I think all of that is the opposite of being responsible, yeah. taking action and being good. And if, if I could spin that in a way back to, you know, the, the whole hunting discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think those are fairly sage words for us to take to our, you know, our inner circles, our outer circles and our wider audiences and communities, because that's, that's our, like, that's what we got to do, right? We have to be good. We have to take accountability on an individual basis for everything that we do in, in, as a hunter, we're obviously talking about hunting I and mean, there's lots of other components yeah. to our lives. I'm not saying I'm only a hunter. You're only a hunter. People listening are only hunters. Um, we have to be good, you know, husbands, fathers, professionals, you know, wage workers, business people, whatever. Right. Yep. We, we got to do a lot there. And look, as I say that, I understand that when we're sitting here saying we have to do better and be better and take accountability for our pastime, like that sucks, right? Hmm. That's our, that's our recreation. Yeah. for most people. Yeah. And so we're saying you got to work there too. And that, and that's not easy to, to say, and it's not easy to hear, but we have no other course of action right now. Right. We have to take the, the words you said, I think to heart, this is what I posted up on that post of yours, right. Was we have to change our own hearts before we can focus on changing other hearts. Right. And I think that's, that's a really critical part of this whole discussion. And I think we could get really down a rabbit hole on what exactly do you do and what exactly is this mm-hmm. and what and, – and I, and I think that tactically speaking, there's lots of discussions to have in this Absolutely. space. And, Absolutely. And I already have my own tactical you know, attack plan or, or emotion plan for where I want to be in six months and a year and where, where, where I want this discussion to be going in the public arena. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, it's pretty simple when you, when you break it down. Be intrinsically good, mm-hmm. and everything else can flow out of that. Yeah. And that's in every part of your life, mm-hmm. you know. And like you just said, and it's not just in the hunting space. And then it's like, I don't get so offended or or hurt when somebody that's my neighbor is like upset with me because I killed something. I'm actually open to a discussion yeah. and yeah. having great point. And, and, and I yeah. think that it it flows more naturally. Yeah, great point. Because you're trying to be good. You're not trying to be right. That's a huge point. So, I, dude, we could keep talking. I know you got to go, <laughs> but we need to get. I, need I, to I, I'm this not again. saying I want to. I just unfortunately <laughs> have to. I could. Uh, I could go down that that hole pretty deeply, right? But yeah. And uh, I just want to tell people that are listening to go check out uh, Beyond the Kill podcast and the Journal of Mountain Hunting. Um, Adam and 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 guys, really, you're doing a, a great job, and I love the content that you produce and. It's uh, smart and uh, relevant and and opinionated and meaningful <laughs> at, time. at, at times, <laughs> and uh, and I and I like that. I, I think it's uh, we need uh, that kind of representation 
in the world at large for what we do. So I appreciate that. And I thanks for coming on the podcast. Well, no, thank you, Brian. Those, uh, those kind words mean a lot. That's the kind of stuff that gets me jumping out of bed in the morning and wanting to be good, right? Is when um, we get feedback like that. And, and I will say that, uh, as you mentioned when we, when we got rolling here, um, we've been trying to get a conversation going for a while and I do wish it was under different circumstances, but I'm, I'm very appreciative of your time today and happy we finally made it happen. Yeah, for sure. Me too. Long overdue. Long overdue. Yeah. Cheers, man. All right, man. Well, I'll be seeing you. Take care. Yeah. Stay gritty. Bye-bye. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman.